This is Tony Brew Ministries, and here comes another sermon from God's Anointed Word. The title is, How to Get Your Pep Back. Most of the time when you're driving down the road, and you come to a red light, you stop on red, don't you? You go on green. All right, just want to make sure. I'm going to ride around with y'all like y'all know what's going to be happening. My question is to you, when do you go on red and stop on green? The answer is when you're eating watermelon. (laughs) Go on red, stop on green. Well, go on red when you get to green, you better stop. You still hungry for watermelon, you better buy you another one. How to get your pep back. The Bible word for pep is zeal. It has to do with a holy, fervent desire for that which is right. Standing up for godliness and holiness. God in Christ himself is our greatest example. You've heard the expression, my get up and goes done got up and went. Well, this message will help you get your pep back. God has zeal. God is not just sitting up there in heaven, twiddling his thumbs, wondering, well, what in the world am I going to do? And I don't know what in the world is going to happen, and the situation in the world is worrying me, and I don't know what to do to save mankind. God is a God of zeal. He's a God of passion. God is a God of love. And when he loves us so much that he calls himself to do something, Love drove him to action. Love compelled him to action. He had a zeal for us. He didn't have to have anything in the world to do with us. And you can spend your time trying to figure out why in the world God would have something to do with us. But instead of doing that, we can take that energy and just praise God that he has zeal for us. And it caused him to act. It caused him to do something. Christ, He came all the way from glory. And He had zeal that caused Him to sacrifice Himself, caused Him to live a holy life. And of course, He couldn't do anything else being holy, but it caused Him to come down here and to equate Himself and identify Himself with us and make Himself as one of us and become the Word becoming flesh. That was zeal. It had to do with zeal. Isaiah 59, 17, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. This verse has saving and judging. He put on his head the helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness. He came to save. He had a zeal to save. And that's why he came to the world, to save the world. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He has a zeal to save. That's why he can save from the uttermost to the guttermost is because he has a zeal to save. He doesn't care what kind of harlot it is. He doesn't care what kind of drunk it is. He doesn't care what kind of lifestyle you have or where you come from and what you've done. He will save you anyway if you put your faith and trust in Him. He came to save us, and that's what He wants to do. His zeal drives Him to save us and causes Him to have a joy and a desire to save us. He only judges if He has to. He has on the garments of vengeance. And he is clad with zeal like a cloak around him. And he will judge if he has to. If you want a mean, bad God, an ugly God, that's what kind of God he'll be to you if he has to. But he'd rather save you than judge you any time. Zeal then causes us to have that pep, that zing. In your sing, if you're singing a sad song, put some zing in your sing and have some zeal in your life. Zeal for God's house. 
Psalm 69 verse 9, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. The world didn't like God. God loved the world, but they didn't like Him. They blasphemed Him. They went against Him. And I say, we did things against God. And the reproaches of them that reproach God. Jesus said, I'll come and I'll take the heat for God. I'll let them pour that vial and go out upon me. And they spat upon Him. They beat Him. They tortured Him. They did all those things, those mean things we did to Him. Even putting Him on the cross and crucifying Him. And He said, the reproaches of them that reproach Thee are fallen upon me. You and I need zeal for the house of God. Jesus had zeal for the house of God. He loves the house of God. He loves the church. And you and I are to have zeal. We're to have pep for the house of God. Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 11. Wherefore as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee neither shall mine eyes spare neither will I have any pity and you can look at Israel's history and because they defiled God's sanctuary because they did their abominable things and they set up their abominations and their idols in the sanctuaries they polluted the house of God they polluted the altar they did everything they could to go against God and God said I have blessed you and I've made your nation like the stars of the sky and like the sand of the sea in multitude. But because you've done these things against me, now you are diminished. And if you look at Israel today as a nation, they didn't even have enough to be a nation until 1948 when they were reconstructed and reconstituted as a nation again. Thank God for that. But they should have been all the time. They were diminished so low because they had gone against God, because they rejected their Messiah, because they did the things that were unholy. There's no other nation that has been so high and been brought so low as Israel. And it speaks to us in America today because we as a nation, the land of the free and the home of the brave, there's no other nation like us that has been blessed. But we too can be brought to our knees if we don't get right with God and start seeking the face of God and put our hands in the hands of God. Turn back to the God of our fathers. We too can be brought low as Israel was. Having a zeal for the house of God. Some expression now says, whatever. You talk to somebody and they may talk a little different than you do and you can't quite come to a, an agreement on something and finally you'll say, well, whatever. Well, it's not whatever when it comes to the things of God. It's not no whatever when it comes to the house of God. The house of the living God. John chapter 2, verse 17, His disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. This verse is the same one that was in Psalm 69, verse 9. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. In other words, this thing's done got a hold of me. This thing has consumed me. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. That's why Jesus went into the temple. And this is John chapter 2 near the beginning of his ministry. And then Mark 11 and Matthew 21 near the end of his ministry. He did the same thing. That means that people still ain't listening. He did the same thing. That is, he went into the temple. He drove out those that bought and sold in the temple. He drove them out. He turned the money changers' tables over. He drove the people out that were turning the house of God into a house of merchandise. He said, you bunch of thieves, you turned it into a den of thieves and a place of robbers. It should be a house of prayer for all nations. The house of God is to be a house of God where the poor man can come, where the black man can come, where the white man can come, where the Jew and the Gentile can come, red and yellow, black and white. Everybody ought to be able to come into the house of God. He said, this is a house of God for all nations. When you and I saw it saying, well, we don't like these kind of folks, or we don't like that kind of folk, and when the leaders of our denomination start saying, well, anything's allowed in the house of God now. It's not a temple anymore. It's not a church anymore. Might as well not call it a church anymore rather than turn it into a circus. Yeah. Commercializing the house of God. 
defiling the house of God. And Ezekiel said, I will not spare, I will not have pity, I will diminish you because you have put your abominations in the house of God. And the Galilean, the gentle, humble, lonely Galilean becomes righteously indignant and he comes into the house of God as a king of the house of God, as a savior of the house of God. He comes into the church and him being the head of the church, he drives them out. Amen. How in the world are you doing these things? What sign are you showing? He said, you take it down in three days, I'll raise it back up. Amen. Oh, not this temple. Surely this was 46 years in building. He wasn't talking about a physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body, and he did raise it up in three days. Amen. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. How to get your pep back. We need to have some pep. We need to have some zeal for the house of God again. You remember when you first got saved, Jesus was all right with you and you were all right with him and he meant everything to you and you loved the church you loved the cat you loved the dog you loved everything you loved jesus you loved the preacher you loved the church you couldn't wait to get to church Amen. now sometimes we can't wait to get away and sometimes it's because of what again the leaders have done they're taking advantage of people turning people into a bunch of slaves and then they say well if you don't do this you don't love jesus it makes people feel guilty. You don't have to feel guilty. There's only one man you need to serve, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who died for you on the cross. Zeal. But we need zeal to cause us to love the church again, to cause us to love Jesus again. And the people in general do. The people love God. The people love the church. The people haven't changed. In a lot of cases, it's those in high places, religious crowd, the Bible used to call them Pharisees and Sadducees. That's the ones who got cold and indifferent. That's the ones who try to reach everybody, and it's all right to reach everybody, but you can't let down the standard to reach everybody. You know, you'll reach them all right, but you won't be able to win them to God because you don't have no standard to reach them and win them with. It's easy to reach the world when you've got the same culture and standard they got. It's not too hard to reach them. All you got to do is go in there and join them. But it's not as easy when you have a standard of holiness. It's time they come to us some instead of we going to them. Yeah, Jesus said go in the world and preach the gospel. That's right. That's what he said. Go in the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not go in the world and try to make yourself like them. Boy, I'm doing some good preaching today. Amen. Zeal for God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 139. My zeal hath consumed me because my enemies have forgotten thy words. America, generally speaking, has forgotten and is forgetting the Word of God. Because if we were going by the Word of God, we wouldn't be having the abomination that's going on on television today. Just so filth and ungodly, parents suing children, children against parents. That's what the Bible said it would happen, but it doesn't have to happen. We need to get right with God. Turn back to the Bible again. The Bible used to have some teeth in our society. It used to have some teeth in the church. It's amazing to me how we can stand up. We can go to a conference. We can stand up and you can have ministerial candidates and you can have people to stand there and here's our manual. Here's our Bible. We believe in one God. We believe the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in Jesus, born of a virgin. We believe in sanctification. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We believe in divine healing. We believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Everybody agrees with that. But everybody ain't acting the same way. Something's wrong. We say we believe the same way, but we ain't acting the same way. But the Word of God says the same thing to the same people, everybody, all the time. Across culture, we don't have to change and we don't need to change the Word of God to match the culture. We need to change our culture to come up to line with God's Word. I'm sick and tired of hearing these denominational people talking about, oh, we got to do this to reach our culture. All you got to do is be faithful to God and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Let your culture come into alignment with God's Word. I know a good culture is called H-O-L-Y. Holy. That's a good culture. I'm consumed. This thing has consumed me because the enemies have forgotten God's Word. Zeal for God's kingdom. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God will bring his kingdom over this earth. And that's what you pray every day. I hope you do. You may not say it out loud specifically, but Jesus said that when you pray, pray thy kingdom come. Every time we pray that every day we pray that we're going along with God's will and God's heart. God's will and heart is to bring his kingdom and he will come in his kingdom. He will bring his kingdom over this world. Jesus tells us to pray that of the government, his peace and increase. There will be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this zeal for the kingdom of God. This kingdom that we have now is not the way it's going to be all the time. It's not no Democrat, not no Republic. It's not the prince of the power of the air who seems to be and is in control to a lot of extent now. But that's not the way it's going to always be. I'm talking about a king. I'm talking about a superstar, sure enough. I'm talking about the only morning star. I'm talking about Jesus Christ who will rule and reign forever. He's king of kings and lord of lords. That's the one I'm talking about. Zeal for the kingdom. Zeal for God's will. Romans chapter 10 verse 2 For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Israel had a zeal for God in the very beginning. God spoke to Abraham and he spoke to Moses and Moses speaks to Israel and he says Shema Yisrael Hear Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and they talked about God and they worshiped God and they had a zeal for God but it was not according to knowledge they were not in the will of God for if they had been in the will of God they would have received the Son of God who is God I have a record, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You can have a zeal and be wrapped up in the wrong thing. Philippians chapter 3, the first part of verse 6, concerning zeal persecuting the church. Paul had zeal. He was Saul then. Saul of Tarsus, he had zeal. He was full of zeal, but his zeal was directed in the wrong way. He was persecuting the church. He was going against Christians. He was binding them, having them bound and thrown in prison, compelling them to blaspheme, doing everything he could against the cause of Christ. He had zeal, but it was directed in the wrong way. He was serving the wrong God. He was serving the devil instead of serving God. He thought he was doing well. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was following the law. He was doing all those things that the forefathers said. But the big component was missing, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. You can have philosophy. You can have knowledge. You can have eloquence. You can go to the big universities of our land. You can study religion. You can study philosophy. You can study politics. You can study all of that. But the big component is missing. Everything is naught if you don't have Jesus Christ. Yes. Colossians chapter 4, the last part, uh, part of verse 13. I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you. This is talking about Epaphras. He was one of them, one of the Colossians. His name means lovely. I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you. Now, the apostle Paul, who was then Saul, had zeal in the wrong direction. And Jesus knocked him off his horse on the road to Damascus. And he said, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. He had zeal, but he had it in the wrong way. And God had to correct him. He saved him. Knocked him off his horse. Knocked him on his behuckas. Knocked him to the ground. And he saved him. And his life was transformed. And now he's got zeal in the right direction. And here's this man named Epaphras. He has zeal for the Colossians. And Paul said, I'm bearing him record that he's got zeal in the right way. 
He has zeal for you. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to do well. Preachers say they want you to do well. They want you to be blessed. But actually, what they want you to do, they want you to depend on them because as long as you depend on them, they feel needed. Well, what God wants us to do, what Jesus said to do, He said, what did He say to do? He said, make disciples of all nations. Then He said, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Jesus said, you don't need me no more. Oh, yeah, Lord, we need you. Yeah, I know about that, but you don't need me anymore. I've done giving you the Word of God. You're fixing to get the Holy Ghost. I'm going back to heaven. That's the way it is with us. You don't need a preacher to stick his bony finger in your nose and tell you what to do. you got the Father, you got the Son, you got the Holy Ghost. What about the preacher? Well, the preachers, thank God for the preacher. Thank God for pastors. Thank God for elders. Thank God for those who are administration and counsel. And they take care of a lot of things in the church. You don't have to worry about that. All you got to do is go out there and carry out the Great Commission. But what does a preacher do? He leads you. He trains you. He helps you. And in a sense, if he trains you like he ought to, and you get zeal for God like you ought to, you could work him out of a job. Because you're doing the Great Commission. You're laying hands on the sick. The Bible didn't say that was a preacher. Just one man. That's what problem in the ministry. We put attention on one man. Super TV screen man. He comes to heal the sick. No, no man can heal the sick. Jesus healed the sick, but he can heal the sick through any of us. Believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It didn't say no special counsel. It didn't say no special group. Believers, if you're a believer, you qualify. Amen. Zeal for God's work. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. I want to be involved in spiritual gifts. Not so it'll make me look good. Not so it'll make me stand out. But so that I can be a blessing. So that I can edify, lift up the church. That takes the focus off the camera on the superstar. And it focuses on the body of Christ. And the preacher, the elder, the deacon, they become one of everybody else. Because we're all working together for the glory of God. The shame and disgrace is that a lot of ministries, when the head honcho dies or something happens to him, God takes him to heaven, then the ministry falls apart because everything and everybody was depending on him. Well, the only reason that should really happen is if Jesus Christ existed and then he ceased to be. If he ceased to be, it would fall apart. Otherwise, it ought to keep on keeping on. Jesus Christ is the only one the ministry really depends on. And as long as he's still God, and as long as he's still on the right side of that throne, everything ought to be all right. We ought to keep on trucking for God. You desire spiritual gifts. Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. We're excited about the work of God. Titus 2.14 Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Can I take just a moment to show you that even in that one verse you have our Pentecostal doctrine. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity, that's salvation, and to present to himself a peculiar people. That doesn't mean peculiar strange. It means peculiar because you're sanctified. That's sanctification. Zealous of good works. You'll never be zealous of good works like you ought to be until you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. So even in that verse alone, you have salvation, sanctification, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Purifying to himself a peculiar people, sanctification, zealous of good works, baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't get away from it no matter how you try. Even if the Bible doesn't specifically say it and verbalize it, it's there, woven, interwoven throughout the pages of God's Word. Yeah. Revelation 3.19 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. We're talking about zeal. 
getting your pet back. Sometimes I get my pet back when my pappy patted my back side. He'll help you get your pet back. Jesus said, I love you. I even sometimes have to rebuke you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Don't say, like my black brothers say, ain't none of me. No, when it comes to you, you better just say, yes, I did it. I'm sorry I did it. By the grace of God, I'll not do it again. Repent and keep on trucking for God. How to get your pep back. Be excited about God's Word. Be excited about His work. Be excited about His house. And it's more than just excitement. You can get excited about a biscuit that's on sale. You can get excited about that little slip of paper you get in there. The belt sale is on sale. You get excited about that. You get excited about a big old cone ice cream. You can get excited about a lot of things. But you know what that excitement does? It kind of wanes away. It goes away. But I'm not talking about excitement. Excitement comes and goes. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about zeal. I'm talking about something that will make you feel fine all the time. I'm talking about being excited for Jesus to the point that you have zeal. That even in sadness, even in sorrow, even when times are bad and things go wrong, you still have a zeal for God. You feel bad in your body. You've got a headache. You've got a fever. And you're sick. But that joy still churns and burns in your heart. It's because you still have your pep. You still have your pep. And when you get weak and you get frail, you still have pep for God. And that's one of the big things that we as seniors have to deal with because your body's about worn out and you can't do things anymore. But your heart's still running after God. Your heart still wants to do something for God. And they'll call me on the phone and say, I want to do something for God. And I'm thinking, you can't even hardly get around. can't even get out of bed. You want to do something for God. But that's just the way this zeal does. It won't give up. It won't let you give up. You might give out, but you won't give up. It won't let you alone. It'll be with you till you get to glory, and when you get to glory, it'll still be there. Your spirit never gets old. Your spirit is forever young. In the spirit, you're 20 years old all the time. You really are. You're not even 20. You don't even have an age. You're ageless. When God created you, when your life began at conception, you became a living spirit, a living soul, and that part of you will never die. Amen. You will live forever. And you never get older. You always stay the same. That's why when things go bad and wrong around you, you still feel good in Jesus because that part doesn't change. That part doesn't come and go. But these people say, well, things are going wrong. Jesus talked about them. They don't have root in themselves or they're caught by the cares and things of this world and they last for just a little while and they're choked out. Only one group was those who were good and they produced fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. But the thing is, these people who are so easy to what we call throw in the towel. I've heard that expression so much, throw in the towel. Well, I already told you the other day, you better not throw in the towel. If you came up like we did, you didn't have no towel to dry off on. Better not throw it in. That's the way it is. If those who want to give up so quickly don't realize that Jesus is the same all the time. Your life with Him is the same all the time. Well, I hope today... You've got your pet back. Jesus wants you to be excited about serving Him. More than excited, He wants you to have zeal to serve God. Thanks for giving a listen to this sermon entitled, How to Get Your Pet Back. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. That will certainly give you zeal and pep. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. 